Perfect. Nice, uh, nice to meet you. Nice to hear you. So uh, hopefully you're doing well, your family as well. And um, uh, so today's uh, uh, topic of uh, today's uh, conversation uh, uh, will be leveraging analytics to improve decision making throughout uh, a basketball organization. And uh, I would like also uh, to make um, uh, to tell you uh, to make a short introduction of a uh, background of Jake. Uh, Jake most recently spent uh, five seasons as the director of basketball analytics and technology for the Phoenix Suns. Uh, he was the first full-time hire in uh, basketball analytics uh, for the Suns organization and the group uh, grew to five full-time employees uh, by the time of his departure. Uh, his work uh, encompassed all levels of the Suns basketball operations group including strategy, player evaluation, scouting, coaching, player development, and operations. After leaving at the end of the 2018-2019 uh, season, Jay has spent the past year consulting multiple startups on how to implement analytics into their processes uh, and uh, is in development on starting his own basketball data venture. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, my name is Nikita. I'm a global director of basketball. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm really intrigued about uh, today's uh, webinar uh, because we've never had uh, uh, so uh, high level uh, specialists uh, so far uh, here. Uh, and I would like to pass my words uh, to Jake. Great, Nikita, thanks so much for the introduction. and. Everyone who I can't see, I hope you're doing all right. And obviously these times are weird, but hopefully you're immersing yourself in hoops because um, there's obviously more to learn on that front. And that's what I've been doing on, on in my end is spending time watching film and trying to learn more. Um, and so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I have like a very um, mediocre presentation to share, um, but uh, hopefully you'll find it um, intriguing. Let me definitely give me one second. Wait. Does that work, Nikita? Yeah, it works. I can see we can see your screen. Great. Um, so what I really wanted to focus on with this presentation is so the word analytics um, gets thrown around a lot. And, you know, it's a scary word in some ways because um, if you're not necessarily familiar with, you know, numbers and math, or you don't feel as comfortable with that, um, it can get a bad rap. And all you can see, you can see that in the media, especially. And so what I wanted to start with was this analytics misnomer. And that word, if you're not familiar, it just means a, um, it's the incorrect uh, definition of what ad analytics actually means. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to just kind of walk through what what does analytics even mean? What is that word? Where does it come from and what does it mean? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that people think of is don't shoot mid-range jumpers because Charles Barkley and people in the media um, will will assign that's what analytics means. Is all we're saying is, you know, if like uh, DeMar DeRozan hits a game-winning shot for the Spurs, um, mm -hmm. it's screw you analytics um, because he shot a mid-range jumper. Um, that is definitely not what analytics means. It is, in some cases, uh, one of the suggestions that um, analytics may suggest. But in general, it, that's definitely not what it means. Um, similarly, it doesn't just mean shoot more three-pointers. Um, people uh, associate the Houston Rockets, for instance, with the uh, three-point revolution. And a lot of that has to do, driven by Daryl Morey's uh, analytical um, mm -hmm mindset but just because they are shooting more three-pointers doesn't mean analytics just means shoot more three-pointers and it doesn't mean calculus and by that i mean it doesn't you don't need to know advanced math or calculus to be able to perform analytics or uh, start deriving analytical measures what analytics does mean is using data to make better decisions um, and so and that's just crucial in any organization um, but especially in a, in a sport as competitive as basketball. And by that, I mean um, any way your organization can get a competitive advantage over your competitors, um, that's something you should look into. And one way to do that is by using data to better understand the game and, and your players and um, make better decisions based off that data. And so what I'd like to do is go over 
um, some of the main ways analytics can enhance your basketball organization and talk about how um, I spent some time working through that in, in, in an MBA organization, but there's no reason why any level organization shouldn't invest a little bit into analytics. And so some of the, some of the ways it can help are in uh, the coaching and in-game strategies uh, piece, scouting and player evaluation, player development. And so I'm gonna spend some time going over um, each of those three elements. Um, but other value adds areas, and this is just, you know, there are more than just these, these uh, areas, but just wanted to touch on um, technology investment. And so by that, I mean, you, as you probably, as you probably know, um, there is each year, there are more and more uh, advanced technologies being developed that are geared towards helping basketball teams, both mm -hmm. in terms of wearable player wearable devices, um, player development technologies in terms of tracking shooting, um, things like that. Analytics though, um, people who have a specialty in analytics can help you um, figure out what, what would the right investment be. Um, and then also operations. And this is one of the areas that's often overlooked with analytics um, in terms of video workflow um, and things like being able to log scouting reports, things like that. People who have an analytical background can automate a lot of that information um, so that you're you're performing a lot less manual work. And so you can spend, you can use your resources um, to work on things that you think would have more of a more of a value add than um, simply, you know, typing up reports and and trying to manually do all of those things. Um, and then in, in working with the training staff as well in terms of um, helping them collect all their data on on the players in their training sessions and athletic performance sessions. Um, and helping them also uh, work through the types of different technologies that they could use to enhance their work. Um, and so that is not my area of expertise, but there are many different uh, facets where analytics can really, really help you um, in trying to leverage them um, throughout your organization will just lead to a more efficient operation and a, and a more likely uh, winning operation as well. Um, and so first, first piece, um, which is probably the most commonly used across the world um, is using analytics in terms of coaching and in-game strategy. Um, and so some of the areas where um, that is important, um, the first is in terms of opponent scouting. And so, you know, of course, and I'll go into it a little more detail on the next slide, things are a bit different um, between the NBA and the rest of the world in terms of how what types of information they have um, to perform the opponent scouting. Um, and so obviously Instat has a lot of tools to help with this and um, I will go through um, the platform at the end of this presentation for a few minutes to just show you how I personally use it. Um, but the opponent scouting in terms of being able to uh, evaluate tendencies in opponents and um, what types of lineups are they playing and who are the most efficient in those situations, um, doing as much as you can to assign data um, to the tendencies of an opponent can really help you know, both the assistant coaches and the head coaches have a better idea of how to prepare for the upcoming opponent. As I just mentioned, lineup and rotation recommendations. And so a lot of that depends is an internal team analysis, um, collecting information, on how different lineups are performed and the types of rotations um, that you would recommend based on the opponent that's upcoming, because you know a team may be playing um, a different type of a, a different collection of players in terms of size or skill set. Um, you may want to alter the type of rotation you have based on that, and using objective information and data um, to help provide those recommendations to the coaches can enhance what they what they see, and obviously in the end. That is, it's going to be on them to make that decision, but giving um, the, the coaches all the information that they could have to properly prepare for the opponent is absolutely vital. Um, and then post-game analyses. Um, so included in that um, would be a breakdown right after the game, trying, in, you know, in, in some ways, analytics, um, analytical people could automate a lot of these um, analyses, but 
being able to immediately provide information and breakdowns um, to the coaching staff after the game um, so they can better digest what actually happened. Um, as, as for the coaches who are on, the, on this webinar, um, you know that after a game, you have a lot going on in your head and um, you're usually a little biased towards um, certain instances that happen during the game. And that's why you rewatch the film after the game. But um, providing information um, so that you can channel your focus to certain elements of the game um, rather than spending too much time um, trying to go through the game um, can be extremely helpful for you guys. Um, and then in a similar light, overall just tying data to video. Um, and so I found that to be an extremely important because you know, for, for myself who, who has more of a, a math background, um, I can look at data and kind of and understand what happened in, in a game. Um, however, you know, that's not the case for a lot of people who are working in the industry. Um, but one way that, you know, speaks to myself and then everyone else is um, tying the data to that video. So not only do you have the, the numbers and the information um, from, from the game collected and, and, um, and thought through, you have that tied um, directly to video so you can watch um, specific clips or um, specific possessions that um, were important and would need to be either shared with your team after or adjustments to be made in, in, the, in the near future. So I'd like to shift a little bit to um, scouting and player evaluation. And, and, and this is an area where um, this is the most recent um, development, at least in the NBA, is applying um, analytics more on this side of the th side of the coin, where um, I imagine for a lot of European teams, um, that's it's not necessarily the case. And um, a lot of that has to do with player tracking data. Um, and so I just wanted to talk through what that is. Um, I think in the near future, this is going to be something that's going to be implemented over in Europe um, and at other levels besides the NBA. Um, but the reason um, the NBA at the NBA level, um, you, you've seen more analytical front offices being developed um, is because of this player tracking data, um, which is now been in existence since the 2013-14 season in the NBA. And so what that is, um, to give a, as, as a quick and not confusing of a breakdown as I possibly can, um, essentially each of the NBA arenas have uh, cameras at the, uh, above the court. And during the game, they're basically lasers um, on each of the players that, and they will track their movement um, 25 times per second. And so you can essentially, on, in a 2D form, uh, follow the action of the, both the ball and the players um, and where they're moving um, throughout the game. And so oh, wow. there's, there's obviously a lot you can do with that information um, in terms of being able to assign events um, to certain actions throughout the game. Um, and so if you want to evaluate a player's pick and roll efficiency rather than um, using or you can actually just use directly the data that's provided um, to mark every pick and roll. And then you have, and you can do your own analysis on what you want to measure off of that pick and roll um, in terms of scoring efficiency or passing efficiency. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's what you, what, what the NBA teams do with that information is extremely close to the chest. And what I've obviously done with the information with Phoenix, I can't share, um, but it is, a fascinating data set um, that has taken off and probably why throughout the league you've seen um, fewer trades and it's a more risk averse environment in general in terms of acquisitions um, because teams have gotten smarter on which types of players are winning players. Um, and a lot of that has to do with balance and I'll go over this in a sec, but balancing um, the all the objective information you can capture um, from player tracking with the subjective evaluations that um, scouting personnel are paid to do. Um, so if you have both sides of the, of the coin uh, covered, you're more likely to make a smart evaluation of a player. Um, so going beyond the box score. And so uh, you could think of analytics, and this is also one of the things that, you know, it is kept 
everything is kept very private in, in terms of how analytics has evolved in the NBA because teams can't are not going to share what they've been working on um, because it's such a competitive environment, as I um, as I indicated in the first slide, um, as you guys know. And so, um, but in general, I think people still think of box score numbers as analytics. And, you know, technically, yes, that is data. Um, but I think everyone on this call would understand that the box score doesn't do a great job capturing actually how much, imp what type of impact the player actually had um, in, in a particular game. And so, um, for instance, you think you, you look at a box score after a game and you, you read points, rebounds, and assists. Um, one, you're not getting any sort of defensive information and um, pl plus minus and, and stats like that are, um, they're way too dependent on teammates and situation to really have too much value. Um, and so you're not getting much in terms of their defensive impact. Um, and also in terms of just, you know, think about the assist number, which is dependent on teammates making the shot. Um, if a player makes a bunch of pass, good passes that lead to missed shots, um, in the box score, that's not captured. Um, but those are the types of things you want to capture um, in which player tracking data helps uh, teams capture um, and gives you a better sense of how much, how much uh, winning impact the player actually did have in a particular game. And not only that particular game, but through every game. And that's where um, this is where it's important to um, balance that objective and subjective information. And so by that, I mean, so it's impossible, unless you're superhuman, it is impossible to watch every single basketball game for a player that you'd like to watch. Um, and so usually you're watching just a subset of games and that's, and obviously there's a lot you can get from um, studying film and watching a player um, when you're evaluating them. Um, however, there are still games you're gonna miss. Um, and in those games, there's usually something interesting or something that you can, or what, what, what I'll call predictive about that player that happened in that, in that particular game. And that's where analytics can be extremely powerful in terms of you can, as long as the data, as long as you've followed the, the previous steps of, of trying to go beyond the box score and not just looking at box score um, to um, provide a, a, a proper evaluation of a player, um, you'll have that information on every single game. Um, and so in terms of you'll have a good idea um, of what the objective, which is what the analytics will tell you with by objective, I mean, unbiased um, and purely data driven. Um, and then the subjective, which is, you know, uh, what scouts get paid to do is watch game, watch film and um, come up with an opinion about a player based on what they've seen. Um, and so when decision makers are evaluating players are making selections in terms of free agent signings um, or uh, draft picks, um, they're tasked to combine all of that information in terms of what their scouting personnel um, has, has come up with, along with what that objective information um, is, what that story is telling as well to make a final decision. Um, and obviously the more information you have on a, on a particular player, the more likely you are to get it right. And so in terms of just general decision making, um, no decision is 100% certain. You're not, if, if you are, I would love, hit me up, please. I'd love to talk to you because I, I have never, I, I don't know how you do it, how you're ever 100% certain on the decision. Um, but if, if you are, let's say on these draft picks, 60% um, sure that this guy will be good. Um, if you get even more information in terms of um, eyes on the guy in film, um, background person, uh, background information, and then also on the data side, you collect more information than that's publicly available on a particular player. You, let's say you increase those odds to 80%. Um, you have that 20% bump in, in terms of uh, likelihood of success of a player is invaluable in terms of making your decision. Um, and so that's really where analytics can, can be extremely powerful is in terms of being more certain when in terms of evaluating players. Then the, the last main piece that I wanted to cover was player development, um, which obviously goes some in line with the coaching um, in-game strategy side, but in terms of the off-court strategy, in terms of how you're going to take these young players and, and, and work on um, developing them. 
how can analytics help with that as well? Um, and so in terms of helping identify improvement needs. And so um, when you, you know, you'll have a good idea based on some, some in the box score and usually coaches are extremely observant in terms of uh, where, an, uh, where a player is struggling, but um, having a, an analytical breakdown of each of your players um, will identify, especially if you go back beyond, as we discussed in the last slide, going beyond the box score um, in terms of, um, trying to quantify defensive impact um, in other areas on the offensive end um, that impact winning, the analyti proper analytics can really help you identify um, those improvement needs. Um, and then I'd say most importantly, um, in terms of information communication, and I'll discuss this more in a sec, um, but the, the way, what I found is, you know, a lot of players, especially now, they've grown up in an era where analytics has become more a part of the process, um, especially at the young, as, as, as every year, every year that a, a new draft class would come in, they seem to be more um, aware of analytics and how it can help them. And um, that that's a lot to do with on the teams are investing heavily, at least in the NCAA level in um, utilizing analytics um, and communicating with their players um, by sharing information. Um, and so that's extremely important at the MBA level as well. Um, and so information communication um, encompasses a lot of different things. And that includes um, creating a way to uh, reports or um, applications, mobile applications to share um, data or information that's easy to understand directly to players? Um, or is it creating that same um, app or report, sharing it directly to the player development assistant coaches um, who will then communicate that directly to the players? Um, and so everything, all that is going to be dependent as I don't need to instruct coaches on, on how to communicate with players because that's what you guys are so good at. Um, but uh, each each player is different. And so obviously some players are gonna to wanna to directly see that information themselves, um, whereas some players are not gonna be interested, but are more uh, verbal learners. And if, if um, a player or if a coach talk, talk them through what some of the analytics are suggesting, um, that, could, that could be a, a method for it as well. Um, but I, I found it to be more vital um, each year I was working in Phoenix as, um, you know, we, we were definitely a young team where this, um, where we could see how these younger players were more familiar um, with those processes. Um, and that's just going to continue um, as basketball is getting smarter worldwide. And so those are kind of the, the main areas of focus um, and where I think in, analytics not only have been impacting um, NBA organizations, but could continue to impact um, teams worldwide in the future and will do so as um, as I mentioned, player tracking data becomes available. Um, but in the meantime, you know, even without player tracking data, there's still a lot of ways um, to utilize analytics. Um, and a lot of that is in terms of being creative. Um, and so be, the whole be objective and creative um, is, so what I mean by that is by being objective, I mean, be unbiased. And so you could create and this, is, this happens in every industry outside of basketball too, is you have an analytics group. If they, aren't, if they are not objective, um, they, you can create any sort of data set to tell any sort of data, a story that you want. Um, but the only way on the analytics side, you're gonna build trust with the coaches and decision makers is if you are objective. Um, and so you have to be, the information that you're collecting and sharing needs to be as objective as you can possibly make it. Because um, if you're biased, if I like us, our particular player, um, if we, let's say we're deciding between two different players um, and I like, I have a preference and you don't trust that I'm gonna completely provide objective information um, to suggest which of the two players we should, uh, we should pick, then the relationship won't work and analytics in general won't work. However, if I provide information that is completely unbiased and, and data-driven, um, then, then that relationship's more likely to thrive. Um, and then by creative, I mean, and this is what I was saying before with, with the lack of player tracking data on, at the European level, 
Um, there are still ways um, to collect information on players that go beyond the box score. Um, and so analytics isn't just um, purely doing, as, as I mentioned on the first slide, it's not like doing calculus or, or advanced math or obviously being able to do some coding helps um, in terms of the efficiency of the process and helps with the operation side. Um, but you don't need to be an expert in math or, or coding to, to be an analytics expert. Um, and so be creative in the type of information that you're collecting. Um, and I'll walk through in a sec how the MSAT platform can help with that. Simplify your information and communicate. And so this is probably, I should have put this as the number one key reminder, but um, no matter how awesome the information you, you collected is and, and analyzed, um, if you can't simplify it and communicate it with decision makers, then it's completely useless. It's just a cool thing you did. Um, but if there's no impact on the final decision um, or the people who are making those decisions can't understand the information that you presented, then it's completely useless and you failed at your role. And so um, trying to really keep in mind, even if you have something pretty complex put together, or if you have a lot of information um, that you would like to present. And a way I would suggest is trying to summarize all of that into a few points. Um, and then, you know, if you wanna pro provide all the detailed reports that you've created, um, you can do so as an appendix. Um, but I highly recommend um, trying to simplify everything into just a few takeaways. And, um, that is part of an analytics role um, in general is being able to look through um, all of the numbers and understand which of these are most important. Um, and that 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 reminder goes across all of the different uh, areas I talked about, um, but especially in the coaching in-game strategy section, um, which where you could have you know fifteen pages of data on a on an opponent, but part of your role is also to be able to go through all of it and understand. Um, the strengths and weaknesses and being able to and write them out and share with uh, the coaching staff. Last, um, I would just say, don't let data scare you. Um, and this is something I've come across a lot and I've gotten, um, you know, as, a, as an analytics personnel, um, you get pigeonholed in a way in terms of like being able to, you're just, I'm just a math guy, um, not a basketball guy. Everyone who's working in this industry are basketball people. They have different skill sets. The people, who, some people who have played, um, they see the game in a way that I can't understand because when I'm on the court, I, I, have, I just stand in the corner and shoot threes. Um, but at the same time, I have a background and numbers make a lot of sense to me and basketball makes a lot of sense to me. And so those, those two combined, um, as I'm watching basketball and understanding numbers, um, I'm able to, to, be, to understand analytics and. Um, hopefully add value in, in that area. Um, but in the end, the teams who are, you know, the, if you start acting like Charles Barkley, the way he talks about analytics or how it's pre presented in the media, that's to your loss because other teams, other really intelligent teams are using data at, at a high level and they're using it to their advantage. And they're not going to share it in the media. They're not going to start talking about it in the media either. Um, but if you look, all, I'm not going to point uh, point to specific teams um, in the NBA, but if you look at over the you know the teams who have been the most successful over the last five, six years, even ten years, um, there's a strong correlation to how robust their analytics operation is um, to their success. And that's, I mean, in the end, that is the highest level, and and there's a reason that teams continue to invest more. And so, if even if it's not a a popular thing in in your league. Um, if you start to, to figure out how to, to use it to your advantage and how to create more information um, to better understand opponents and, and players that you're, you're trying to sign, it's a way to get ahead of the game. Um, and it's going to continue. It's not going to go away and it's going to continue to become more and more important. And so I would highly recommend considering investing in it if you haven't yet. And so now I just want to quickly go through um, how how can Instead help solve some of these challenges that I, that I presented. Um, and so as I discussed in the last um, in the last point, use use your basketball expertise to create data. And so sometimes, um, as I as I mentioned, you're not going to have the data, of, especially in the European leagues, um, and in uh, if you're evaluating NCAA players. 
Um, you're not gonna, all you're gonna have access to is essentially play-by-play -play data. Um, and then also the um, box score information. Um, and then, but you, Instat will, is a way um, to not only look at more advanced information that they've collected on players, but also it's a tool that you can use um, to do your own analysis as well. And I found it personally, I started using it um, in 2018 um, and, I was blown away at how easy it was to to use their platform to, as I was watching games. Because I, as I'll walk through, I watch games a little differently. Differently, and I know everyone has their own way uh, of watching games. And instead, I found to be an extremely um, helpful way for me to to watch games. Um, and so I'm just going to get out of this presentation. And so this is the uh, Instat platform. And as you are familiar if you're in this webinar, because I imagine you've used Instat at some point. Um, and so I'm going to um, go through just a couple possessions of a, of a FC Barcelona game where I'll walk through um, how I would personally be using this platform um, to create my own data set um, as I'm watching video. Um, and so, I'm not going to focus on this excellent uh, this excellent tool that I know some people in the past have have focused on, um, but obviously there's a lot to take away on this. And if I had three hours to talk to you guys, I, I could go through all of this. Um, but I wanted to just focus on one one particular area um, that I find extremely um, that stands instead apart, apart um, from the competitors, honestly. Um, and so. We'll watch the uh, game time of this game against Bayern. And so the tool that I that I find um, to be extremely useful is the tagging tool down here. Um, and the way that you can assign hotkeys, and this is your way of being able to collect information and being creative and all the things that I that I mentioned. Um, and so, and also going beyond the box score. And so Instead of as I'm watching, you know, marking up pep, points, rebounds, those are things, play types, those are things that Instat has already done. And that's awesome. And there's a lot to be done with the, that information. Um, but there's also certain things that are, you know, I mentioned in the scouting player evaluation, balancing subjective and objective. Um, there are certain things that, as you basketball experts and, and myself, um, would want to try to measure. Um, that go beyond that box score um, that would be helpful to collect in in mass moving forward. So um, one thing, a couple of things um, that I was thinking of that um, you know I brought up assists earlier. Um, trying to measure the difficulty of passes in terms of making um, passes in tight windows or, or difficult pocket passes. Um, and so what I want to do is add a tag, and I have already added a tag here. I'm going to delete it. Um, the um, making pass like trying to measure specifically tight passes. Um, what you can do is go to this tag and add add a couple tags that you can then mark as you're watching games. Um, what I also want to do though is be able to measure the the positive tight passes, um, and by tight I mean difficult, um, and then also the ones that were poorly executed. Um, and what's nice is you can clip these so that if I tagged it at the end of the at the end of the, the pass, um, we'll make sure that it's captured in the um, when you when you make the tag. And so we'll just select the hockey A, but if you wanted to select A B as your hockey, um, you can do that, that you can hold down A and B at the same time. Um, but then since as I mentioned, um, we also want to measure the um, minus the minus tight passes as well. We'll add a we'll add a tag for tight pass minus. And then I forgot to mention this. This is where it's nice. You know if it's a positive, negative, or um, or neutral play. In these areas, we're going to focus on the positives and the negatives. And then before I get started on the defensive side as well. And so that, that's just one area and you can imagine, you can take this and, and think about how um, all the different things you, when you're watching a game um, that you'd want and build your whole, your entire own framework that you can use um, when you're watching games. Um, but on the defensive side, one area, 
that doesn't get measured, you know, as I said, most measure don't get measured in the box score. Um, but in terms of, of the correct help defense. So I'm going to do help D plus one or help D plus a C. I forgot to make it a, a green. I'm, I apologize. Help. So there you go. Um, and so I'm going to hit play. And I'm watching in terms of uh, Barcelona right now. Um, and so I'm looking for specifically difficult passes that I'd want to note as I'm as I'm watching. So there there was a good one thrown by Corey Higgins right there, um, a, a pocket pass into the paint, which eventually leads to an open three point shot for Miritich. Um, if I go back a little bit, where I want to mark this pass, I can hit pause there, and then I would hit A. As you can see, the tight pass plus window comes up. And then you would mark Higgins C um, to indicate that that pass was made by by Higgins, um, which led to an open shot. And there are many, as I'm hoping you're seeing this possession, there are many things that you're you're noting that, oh, I I, I would mark it this way. Um, or these are the types of things that I'd want to mark um, in the platform. Um, but you can continue to, as you're watching, now we're watching on the defensive side to see um, right now we're measuring um, help defense. So right there, 30, Miritich 33 is late on the um, on the help at the rim. Um, he's he doesn't rotate correctly, and so that's where I would mark the the D that I created um, for help D minus. But hopefully, as you as you think about how you could all the different types of things you can measure, you can in integrate it in this platform um, and it will be, um, you can eventually just build your own sort of framework that uh, over time as you're watching more and more games. So there's another great pass on the cut by Hanga. And now we're watching again for, for any help defense. Um, that would be, and there's a, there is positive help by Miritich. He made up for his play on the last one um, and you would mark it there. And so you get the idea of, of the things, um, all the different types of, it's endless. And this is where the be objective and creative is really important. Um, be creative with the types of information you're, you're collecting on guys. And what's nice, what makes the platform powerful um, is you can go up here to go to your, my tags window, um, which will open up as you see here, are the, the, the information that's been collected. Um, so as you're watching more and more games and you're collecting more information, um, you can download this information here with this XML button. Um, obviously, this is where some having some coding or analytical experience can help, um, but XML information is really easy to use. You can open it in Excel um, if, you, if you want to. And then as you cre create your own data set, um, over time, you'll have a better, a better sense of um, things that are dif more difficult to measure, um, such as the things I, I, I focused on, which were um, difficult passing and uh, help defense. And so I think that kind of summarizes what, uh, what I have for you. Um, I hope you learned something. Um, I apologize if I spoke too quickly or um, you didn't understand what I was saying. Um, I tried my best to convey um, all, the, all the ways analytics could be powerful for your organization. Um, and so I hope you learned something. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jake. It was uh, uh, really interesting. And uh, uh, thank you uh, for sharing your experience, especially from the analytical point of view. Yeah, how you <clears throat> implement uh, uh, your analytics skills uh, into uh, Instat. Uh, yeah. And um, um, uh, for me, yeah, it was uh, it was an extremely uh, extremely interesting conversation, and um, um, I have a I have a question. Uh, so could you could you please uh, open uh, your presentation and uh, uh, the slide where you were speaking uh, uh, speaking about uh, analytics? Uh, what does it stand for? Um, yep. 
Yeah, yeah and uh, and uh, and uh, you mentioned that uh, analytics is not about uh, don't shooting. Uh, don't shoot mid-range jumpers, uh, shoot more three-pointers. And what do we con uh, consider? Uh, so uh, we see that uh, in modern basketball, there is a trend yeah, that uh, teams are taking more three-pointers. Even here in, in Europe, yeah, if we compare, for example, um, I don't know, EuroLeague teams uh, uh, back to three years ago uh, and uh, three consecutive seasons, uh, 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 starting from uh, 2016 until now, we see that there is a trend that teams take uh, more and more three-pointers. And, um, uh, of course, it reflects in the number of two-pointers they, uh, they attempt uh, during the game. Um, so uh, what do you think? Uh, does uh, analytics, uh, 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 if if analytics has any influence in this uh, in this trend, I mean, if uh, if uh, uh, NBA uh, uh, analytical uh, groups uh, suggest uh, to coaches uh, really take less uh, two pointers, more three pointers, and uh, this uh, creates a trend uh, in professional basketball, and then it reflects in uh, in general. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question, and so. That is a bit confusing based on the slide because you know that is something that analytics has absolutely had an influence on, um, and it is something I believe that you you know a team should probably shoot more three pointers and shoot fewer um, mid range jumpers. But what I wanted the point to be more was um, some I think when people think of analytics, that's what they think of, um, and the it, it's more complicated than that. And so there are many instances. Um, where taking a mid-range jumper is probably the best shot you can get on a possession. Um, so in general, um, what what analytics would suggest is you know you're tr what you're trying to do is optimize the amount of points you're going to get on a possession. Um, and so when when teams take um, mid-range jumpers, you know in the early or mid shot clock, that's not usually a good shot. And all that's indicating is you could have probably gotten a better shot um, if you kept the possession going in terms of kicking it out to the three-point line um, and creating a better opportunity. And so in general, what what this is just kind of one of the conclusions that have come from analytics and people have then associated it with the word. Um, however, it's important to remember there's always, you have to understand the context. And so if someone pulls up in early shot clock and takes a 30 foot jumper, um, contested 30 foot shot, um, versus if um, a player in a really good set um, on a, a pick and pop, the, the screener who can't really shoot threes pops to 16 feet, um, the player makes the pass to him and he shoots it, an open shot from 16 feet where he makes about 50%. You would rather have that mid range shot than the, um, the three pointer. And that's because the three point shot let's say only had a 20% chance of going in, whereas the, the two point shot had a 50% chance of going in. And so if you use obviously the three pointer is worth more, um, but still there's only, you're only expected to score 0. 0.6 points per possession on the 20% three pointer versus one, one point per possession on the, on the open mid range shot. And so it's more, way more complex. In general, you'd rather shoot an open three than an open two. Um, and there's, and that's obvious why, um, but it, there's no, the conclusion as simple as just shoot more three pointers and don't shoot mid range jumpers is, is just, it's way, too, it's way too broad for what analytics is actually trying to capture, which is mm -hmm. the context. Um, and then also your personnel, it, you, it, it may be different. Like you may have players um, who are way more efficient um, inside the arc and you want to play to towards those. And that's what makes Greg Popovich so special is his team changes their shot selection like every year and how they play. Um, you watch the 2014 championship team versus the 2018 team. They play completely different. And that's because they added a player, players like LaMarcus Aldridge and, and DeRozan who are more efficient um, inside the arc in, in a lot of ways. And so um, being able to adapt to your personnel is really important as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the answer. It was uh, pretty much clear. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, during the conversation, you mentioned uh, that uh, for you, especially for uh, 
uh, analytical groups uh, uh, for analytics in general, there was a game changer back to 2013, 2014, when uh, the NBA started implementing uh, different tracking um, solutions. Yeah. Um, uh 2d model etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah um and um uh, uh okay uh uh so with the nba everything is clear uh in general with the north america everything is clear what but what is my question is uh uh what um what is analytics role when it comes to European players where we don't have uh, tracking data, where we don't have uh, special cameras installed uh, in the arenas, uh, so you cannot uh, objectively um, uh, analyze uh, his efficiency uh, on pick and roll passing or, or on pick and roll creating, driving, et cetera, et cetera. So all you have, uh, you have only only box score statistics, advanced statistics, uh, 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 those KPIs which uh, uh, that teams measure by them themselves, and um, uh, of course a level of professionalism uh, here uh, in in uh, in uh, in Euro even in the Euroleague is not equal, like uh, because some teams uh, they they don't have. Um, uh, uh similarities in terms of budgeting yeah uh because like each team uh is not uh is not is not equal and uh, um and uh, they don't have uh human resources yeah and 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 uh to 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 work with uh, such data so what is uh, uh analytics uh, role uh, in terms of recruiting European players, because we see that there is a trend from year to year. We see more and more European players in the NBA. We see more and more European kids playing in, in the CAA, going abroad to uh, get their scholarships and play basketball and then uh, to uh, to start their professional career. So uh, how to how to uh, make this decision? Yeah. Uh, thanks to analytics and uh, uh and draft a player like look at Doncic yeah uh, because yeah. i think uh, you 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 were one of those teams uh uh and 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 at that moment you was uh uh for, you, you you was a part for for uh, part of a of a, of a, of phoenix suns yeah so when uh when you had a chance to draft him <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm not going to go into too much detail on that um that's for if, if anyone wants to have a beer, I'm available to have a virtual beer at any time um, to talk more about that. But the uh, that's an incredible question and kind of why I wanted to really focus the Instat demo on what I did um, because there isn't that, inf you know, there is the, and I don't want, the information is important that's collected also in Instat, of course, um, in terms of um, like how many pick and rolls they ran, um, things like that that are are really helpful um, in terms of being able to uh, to cut the video and only watch certain in play types and instances that a, a player is involved in. Um, but that's where that that point of being creative is is just it's could be the best advice I could possibly give about this and um, creating your own data, creating your own metrics, um, and a lot of that without you know the resources. Um, or the advanced technology that maybe exists in the NBA, um, that's you. There's a lot of times creating your own data is very expensive, and this is why data companies make a lot of money and why they sell their data for a lot of money um, because it's very expensive and timely to collect data. Um, but if you're willing to to really put in the time and and discuss internally, here here are the ten things. It can be as simple as this: like you could find identify ten areas that you really want each of the players you acquire to um, to be good at. And so those are the 10 areas that you could create uh, tags for in the in the Instat video. And then as you're as you're scouting, um, as your front office evalu evaluators are all watching video, um, that's where you all can collect the same information on the players. And then if you watch, you know, hundreds of games between your between your organization and you're collecting that information over time, you're going to have a lot of different um, takeaways and like this player, this one player X um, checks the box for nine of the 10 areas, whereas the other player we're considering only check the box for five of the areas. And so we would probably most likely prefer, based on our objective evaluation while we're watching the video, we would prefer our 
uh, player X um, who, who checked nine of the boxes. Um, and so that's where you can't let, and you can never let just like, oh, we don't have the data for that as an answer. Um, that's not an acceptable answer um, because there's always ways um, to create your own data and, and to be creative um, with, with how you're evaluating players. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, for the answer. It was uh, really useful. Uh, look, uh, let's um, have some questions here. Um, Coach uh, Giovanni Rivera, hola. Uh, he's asking, uh, are the four factors still one of the main basic analytics? What are the new things you guys are taking a look at? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I didn't bring the four factors are absolutely if you want what the four factors are especially good at um, is if you want as a coach, especially a quick and this is when I brought up the post game analysis that would be at the top of the post game report. Um, because the, in the end, you can look at the four factors and be able to tell if you won the game or not. Um, however, going in in terms of let's say you're trying to evaluate um, why your, your team's effective field goal percentage, um, was higher or low. Let's say you want to know why it was lower than the opponent. That's where it, it requires you to dig deeper, um, into understanding why your team made fewer shots, uh, than the opponent. Was it because you were taking tougher shots? Was it simply, and sometimes it's just because your team didn't make shots, right? And then what it does, it's a make or miss league, as they always say. Um, but sometimes it's because your offense wasn't creating good looks. Um, sometimes it's because your defense was allowing wide open shots to the opponent. Um, and so it's helpful for you to understand, okay, based on these four factors, um, where we lost the two areas we lost were turnovers, um, and free throws, um, really th then, you know, okay, let's dig deeper into those turnovers. What was, why did we not cause any turnovers or why were we turning the ball over or why, why were we fouling too much? Or were we not penetrating the lane enough on offense to draw fouls? And so it's a great way. And I think I brought up the, the summarize everything and simplify it. That's what the four factors is, is a, is a summary of, of information that you can use um, to dig deeper. And that's, and that's what, but you never want to just stop there. You never want to just be like, okay, we lost the effective field goal percentage battle. Um, you want to know more about why you lost it. And that's where, that's where analytics can be really powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have the uh, next question from uh, Stefan Odea. Uh, he asks if you could uh, uh, share with us some examples of uh, 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 what metrics, uh, what are you looking uh, into during the, during the game uh, if you're limited uh, in time? So for example, uh, okay, one, one, one thing is watching a game, uh, um, uh, in front of, of your laptop, yeah, and other thing is watching a game from analytical perspective, yeah, uh, during the game, yeah, and make, uh, so maybe maybe there is, uh, there are some KPIs uh, uh, you measure during the game, you calculate, like, and then uh, you spread it uh, in detail. So. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, and so that depends on if I'm watching from a team's perspective or if I'm evaluating a player. Um, and so if I'm evaluating a specific player, the thing I'm focusing on almost entirely is intelligence. I'm trying to measure their ability to understand the game and make quick decisions. Um, because in general, a lot of the thing, if I only have, you know, if I can't sit there and mark every single thing that they're doing, um, I really want to just focus on smart off ball decisions, things that are more difficult, um, to see if you're watching just a general game and not focusing on a particular player. Um, a lot of off ball, you know, as John Wooden said, basketball is played 90% off ball. And I, I think about that a lot um, and trying to focus on their decisions off the ball. Um, and then also their ability to make, I, that's why I focus on difficult passes because um, being able to see the floor um, and, and executing those passes, I think is extremely important. Uh, that's, that's not rocket science. That, that's just part of basketball. Um, but in terms of the team, um, where if I'm not, you know, if I'm just watching a game and trying to quickly write down things, what I'll end up, the way I would do it is um, I will look at the possession result um, and measure the types of shots that were being created, both on offense and then the types of shots you're allowing on defense. Um, and so 
you know, that's, I'm more interested sometimes in, I'm not as interested in whether or not the shot went in. I'm more interested in the, in the, the shot that was created. Um, and so, you know, this is where we just dis- like just discussed in terms of if you if you, your ball handler runs out, comes off the pick and roll and pulls up and takes a contested 18 footer off balance and makes it. Um, or you run a beautiful, the first set we watched with Barcelona where they created the wide open three um would you rather have what that shot was missed um which shot if you just looked at the end result you would rather you'd say you'd rather have the 18 footer however as a coach you know that you would rather have created that the second shot that Miritich took and so um so when I'm when I'm watching the game from the team context I'm really just trying to measure trying to focus on and measuring the shot quality uh, that was derived um, from the possession yeah great thank you yeah, and uh, we have a last question. Um, do you also measure emotional, uh, I don't know, emotion somehow, analytics, uh, uh, especially focus on the player's state of mind, body language? That's a phenomenal question. Um, I love that. I, it's just, I'm very fascinated by that, um, being able to try to measure that um, objectively. Um, that's where, obviously, when you're doing um, your, your, your background inf- uh, work on a player, you're trying to get a good sense for that. But I found in general, and this is one of those things you can track um, in, in stat when you're, when, you're, when you're going through the film, um, is gesturing um, and sort of like just general um, leadership or being a good teammate. Those are, those are things that um, you can, over time, um, I think that there, there's some clear evidence that players who, um, at least that players that I've looked at in the past, um, who have shown that um, you know, they're running, they're sprinting over to their teammate to help them up if they're, after they fall, um, things like that. You can assign, you know, as simple measurements as like marking it as a plus or a minus if it, if it occurs. And then you accumulate that information over a bunch of video with a bunch of different players. And then you've built a, you've already built like an emotional data set that, you know, of course you don't, you can't understand necessarily the inner workings of a player until you meet them or you find out more uh, from people who, who know them personally. Um, but you can use video um, to get a good sense of how they are on the court in terms of uh, interacting with their teammates and being a leader. Mm, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Jake. Yeah, uh, so we have one more question from uh, Erika's uh, Kirvilaitis. Uh, he asks, how do you deal with the problem that there is not enough game stats data in European basketball and players change teams, coaches, systems being changed so often? Yeah, no, and that's a that's a that's a key one, especially I can say from the NBA side. Um, you know, there's there are teams where players, um, you know, players go from or are really successful in one system and then go to a, another system. Um, and so, I think you're the, the way you're thinking through that problem um, is exactly kind of what an analytics problem is: is trying to add as much context to performance as possible. Um, so if you notice that a player struggled at a particular team um, and then goes to another team and thrives, um, does it mean he's just like a better player or does it mean the coach is u- utilizing him differently and correctly? And so the way is, if you're now interested in that player, is this new way that they're utilizing the way you run your offense and how you want to utilize it? Or would you prefer to utilize him in the air, in the, in the way that the previous team did? and where he struggled. Um, and so trying to figure out um, as many different, you know, you're trying to add as many um, data points to the to predicting how good the player will be as possible. Um, and so understanding um, more than just like, you know, sometimes players just got better by working hard, um, but trying to figure out if, it, if that's the case or, um, you know, sometimes a player is just more comfortable in a city and didn't like living in the previous city. There are all these things which, you know, don't necessarily get associated with analytics, um, but um, people with analytical mindsets um, can really enhance your evaluation um, and thinking through that type of problem. Yeah, thank you. I just want to add that, um, uh, so while you were uh, explaining this, uh, uh, one example came to my mind, um, uh, Javel McGee. Yeah, so quite uh, talented uh, uh, player uh, uh, who played in multiple NBA teams, uh, yeah. So he played. Uh, he had some some good uh, good good seasons in 
Detroit Pistons, if I'm not mistaken, then in Denver, Denver Nuggets. Yeah, but he's... Uh, uh i think his best years were in golden state warriors and i don't know because the way they used him yeah mm -hmm. so he was the most efficient and i don't know if it's uh if there was some influence of analytics in this uh yeah. in this case yeah how to absolutely and so for him where he started to struggle um was when he was being utilized not the way golden state was using him they were starting to feed you know giving him the ball in the post and asking him to create Whereas in Golden State, the perfect situation, all they want their bigs um, to do is, is set screens and dive to the rim and, and make simple passes off the short roll. And, um, and McGee thrives. And then also in transition, they like to get out and, and run. And he's obviously one of the fastest bigs in the world. And so um, it's one of those situations where role is really important. And analytics can, can understand what a player's strengths and weaknesses are. And if you're trying to fit and there's a specific type of player you're looking for in terms of a, a specific role, um, you can have a better understanding of, of what a player's strengths and weaknesses are and fit them into that role. And I think Golden State did a great job um, with McGee, and they've actually done a good job with um, some of their bigs. Uh, Marquise Chris, who's someone I was a part of the team that drafted, uh, really struggled his first couple of years in Phoenix. He's being used more in this McGee role, um, and over the last couple of months before the pandemic um, was starting to thrive in that role as well. And so trying to really find guys um, whose strengths are tailored towards how you want to use them, um, even if they even if they struggled. And honestly, you could you could say those are the guys you're going to find for cheap or the guys who struggled because they are being misused by their team. Um, and if you notice that the certain things that you want them to do, they're good at. That's where you can find those diamonds in the rough. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Jake, I think we're done. So thank you for uh, for the conversation. It was a great pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for sharing your experience uh, uh, and your way of working with Instat uh, from an analytical perspective. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everybody who joined this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, stay safe. Uh, take care of yourself and your families. And uh, stay tuned uh, because next week uh, we'll have at the same time a new webinar and a new guest. Thank you. Bye-bye.